Good morning, everybody. Wow, this is like a classroom. Good morning, everybody. It is great to see all of you here at 10 o'clock in the morning on a beautiful Saturday morning to talk about something very important. Yes, welcome. Thank you. So my name's Jeff Hayden, I'm the president and CEO of Ravinia, and this symposium is really the heart of this entire weekend. Uh, women on the podium <clears throat> and the, the conversation uh, that we had uh, actually is what inspired all the programming and all the ideas this weekend that you're gonna hear about today. So I'm gonna step off the stage and hand it over to our wonderful moderator, Wendell Acoma, and she'll kick it off from here. So thank you so much for joining us today. I will offer my own welcome, welcome on the second day of Ravinia Festival's inaugural Breaking Barriers Weekend. We're delighted to see you all here on this sunny morning for our symposium, Women on the Podium, and a special thanks to the Ravinia Women's Board for sponsoring. I'm Wynne Delacoma, I'm the former classical music critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, and I'll be moderating today. I have a distinguished panel, so let me introduce them. I will keep my introductions very short. They will tell you more about themselves as our session unfolds. To begin, I think you all recognize Marin Alsop, Ravinia's chief conductor. She is, of course, a barrier breaker par excellence. Music director of the Baltimore Symphony from 2007 to 2021, she was the first woman to be named music director of a major American orchestra. The weekend also celebrates the 20th anniversary of the Taki Alsa Conducting Fellowship. Marin founded the program in 2002 to identify promising women conductors. The Taki Awards boost their careers with mentoring pros, programs and cash prizes. Also on our panel is Cheryl Frazes Hill, to my far right. <laughs> the moment she is interim director of the Chicago Symphony Chorus. She's here to help us celebrate another notable anniversary. In addition to the Taki Fellowship's 20th, this is the 100th birthday year of Margaret Hillis, legendary founder of the CSO Chorus. Cheryl is a longtime chorus member. She was a close professional associate of Hillis, who died in 1998. Cheryl is the author of the recently issued biography, Margaret Hillis, Unsung Pioneer, available on Amazon, just to let you know. <laughs> And, and the Northwestern shop, yes. Completing our panel are two Taki Award winners. At my far left, Jerry Lynn Johnson. She was an early winner, a 2005 Taki Fellow. In 2008, she founded the Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra in Philadelphia. In 2015, she expanded her own reach and that of the ensemble by find, founding DEI Arts Consulting. DEI helps organizations of all kinds who deal with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And finally, to my immediate left, <laughs> Anna Doshmal Maros. I think I managed to, to pull that off. Uh, she's the newest addition to the Taki Award roster. She is this year's the 2022 Taki Fellow. You might say conducting is in her blood. Since 2009, she's been principal conductor of the Amadeus Chamber Orchestra of the Polish Radio. Her mother, Aneszka Doszmal, founded the group. Her mother, not her father, founded the ensemble in 1968. Yeah, yeah let's hear it for mom. <laughs> Anna has conducted orchestras throughout Europe and at leading festivals. A.G. Owe was an early mentor, and she has worked with Wynton Marsalis and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. 
Let me briefly outline how we're going to approach things today. We have only 90 minutes, but we'll be looking at the past, the present, and the future, what we see or hope to see in the future for women on the podium. Maybe lessons from the past and the present will help us build a better future for women conductors. We'll start with prepared comments from each panelist and then move into a more free-flowing conversation. We'll allow time for your questions and comments at the end of our session. To begin, let me offer a quick summary of where women are on the podium today. There is some very encouraging news. More women than ever are moving into high-profile positions. French conductor Natalie Strussmann is about to become Atlanta Symphony's first female music director. Cora, yes, let's hear it. <laughs> Korean conductor Eun Sun Kim is music director of the San Francisco Opera, the first woman to hold that job. <laughs> Finnish conductor Susanna Malki and Lithuanian conductor Mir Mirga Grajanice Tila are among the world's most sought after conductors. They appear with leading orchestras and opera companies. Their names regularly show up on lists of potential candidates to replace departing music directors. Women are moving as well into conducting posts just below music director level at prestigious ensembles. Programs to help gifted women conductors advance their careers are being set up. In addition to Marin's Taki Alsa Fellowship, there's the La Maestra competition in Paris and the Dallas Opera's Hearts Institute for Women Conductors. But overall, the number of women on symphonic podiums remains stubbornly small. One year ago, the Women's Philharmonic Advocacy Group, Advocacy Group released some bleak statistics. They looked at the 2021 22 program schedules of 21 of the largest U.S. orchestras. For that 21-22 season, there were 127 conductors straight, slated to perform. 15, one five, were women. That's 10%, 10 10.6% of the total. That's a ratio of approximately 10 to one, 10 men for every woman. That statistic complements the findings of a 2016 report from the League of American Orchestras. According to the League, only 9.2% of the orchestra surveyed had women music directors. Women held only 20.5% of those orchestras other in-house conducting posts. I was going to conclude my opening remarks on an upbeat note. I was going to point out this wonderful weekend at Ravinia. Nothing but women on the pavilion podium Friday through Sunday. All those women conductors, how refreshing, how exciting. But then I thought, wait a minute. Would I be astonished by a weekend of nothing but men on the podium? Of course not. That's just business as usual. That's standard operating procedure. That's what audiences and musicians and arts administrators have come to expect. That's the default mode. It's the way things are meant to be, in large part, because that's the way they've always been. This isn't just Ravinia, of course. Men dominate virtually every classical music podium in the world and in overwhelming numbers. So there's a lot of work to do. Now let's take a look at how we got where we are and where we might be going. Cheryl, will you take it from here? Thank you, Wynn. Good morning, everybody. Um, while I was researching my book about Margaret Hillis, I chose to explore the difficulties that women conductors were encountering as they were pursuing um, their uh, conducting careers. And just about prior to the 1940s, early 1900s, into the 1940s, which was when Margaret Hillis began her um, uh, formal studies in conducting, what I discovered is that there were tremendous consistencies in the barriers that women faced just prior to Margaret pursuing this career, and, and these barriers and the solutions to those barriers, there were many uh, common themes that I encountered. 
And so first I want to just share with you that we should have a little bit of context. Women who were in the instrumental field in the 1940s and earlier were trying to get into orchestras to play and they were not welcomed in orchestras. And so some of the things that they encountered, they encountered um, rude comments or um, scrutinizing um, commentary about the way that they dressed or their appearance or how they moved when they played their instrument or what kind of music they were allowed to play. For example, if it wasn't feminine music, they had no business playing it. Women were really discouraged from even being in orchestras. I'm going to show you a quote. This is by Sir Thomas Beecham. I do not like and never will the association of men and women in orchestras and other instrumental combinations. As a member of the orchestra once said to me, if she is attractive, I can't play with her, and if she is not, I won't. So this, these were the kinds of remarks that were being made as women were trying to pursue being in an orchestra. So you can just imagine how difficult it would be for a women, woman who was trying to get on the podium of these orchestras. And so uh, the other thing to remember is that um, unlike instrumentalists who could take their instrument home and practice it, how could a woman even learn how to, to conduct an orchestra? You can't take an orchestra home to practice. And so they weren't getting podium time, so how do you learn? And then on top of that, who are your mentors going to be? Who are your teachers? These women had nobody that would take them on because they were men and they figured, why am I going to invest time in these women because there's no chance they're going to have a career. Despite all of this, the women, there were brave women who, who, who pursued this. And what they received if they actually made progress was they were, they were the butt of jokes and cartoons and pretty um, uh, embarrassing reviews and so forth. I'm gonna show you a few examples. And by the way, when you walk around the park and you see these marvelous posters of all of these women um, uh, in, in this era, you will appreciate these stories even more. So this was Ethel Laginska. In the early 20s, she was already making a name for herself. She had started out as a pianist, then a composer, and then decided to become a conductor. She had uh, done some conducting in Munich, Paris, etc., and had made a, uh, her debut in Carnegie Hall in 1925. She was what you would call a woman's liber, if you, from back in the day, right? She preferred to dress in more masculinely because she felt that that would give her more um, uh, credibility when she stepped on a podium. She was not intimidated by the way women are supposed to move versus not supposed to move, and she, um, she paid for it. So this is the cartoon that was in uh, 1925, 1927 Music America. And as you can see, they're mocking her mode of dress, the way she looks, her facial expressions, and her gesture. This was the kind of thing that women would encounter if they got so far. Here's another example. This is uh, Antonia Brico, another woman who was making a name for herself in the uh, 1930s and was uh, making progress. And uh, she had a, a career that was fairly respectable, but as she got older, um, the newspapers claimed that actually she was getting better. But here's why. This is her in the 1970s. And this is the quote from Opera News in 1974. It is worth noting that Antonia Brico, another pioneer conductor whose extremely promising career foundered when she was 30 and sexually attractive, is now flourishing when she is a 70, 72, craggy-faced, and sensibly shooed. Nice publicity, huh? So how did these women endure all of this? Well, there are patterns, as I said, that I discovered, and it was so interesting as I started writing about Margaret Hillis to know that these patterns emerged, and I will be interested to see from the panel how they feel about what of these exist today. The first of these patterns was resourcefulness. These women all found ways to find orchestras to work with. There had been a movement in Europe about women's orchestras and women were conducting them. It came here in 1888 with the Fadet Women's Orchestra uh, that was started by Caroline Nichols. And uh, Margaret Hillis also founded her own chorus and orchestra in New York City and uh, when she began her career. Another pattern that I noticed was finding their niche. So 
what, would, what Margaret Hillis did and others is they would focus on a repertoire that others weren't doing, either afraid to do or they didn't think it was um, worthy of, of, well, that audiences would come or what have you. And so they were focusing on repertoire that was less well known, less well performed, debuts, contemporary music. Margaret Hillis had done tremendous amount of work with Igor Stravinsky in New York and she, he, was, he would go to her when he had his uh, newly uh, written choral works. Margaret also became the um, kind of the expert of a piece called Lenos, very difficult piece then and now, and she, was, uh, she really made a name for herself conducting that piece. Another pattern that I noticed is that women uh, of that era would be willing to work for reduced pay or no pay. And, um, and they, they would do whatever they had to do to get on a podium. And they would invest financially, and, and Margaret Hillis did that because her New York concert choir and orchestra, she paid for out of pocket. She was wealthy from her family, and she was able to actually uh, hire professional players. And, and also, she rented out Town Hall for several uh, uh, concerts a year so she'd have a place to conduct. Women also of that era, except for Ethel Laginska, modified the way they dressed, the way they asserted themselves, and, and just made up, tried to, and even the way they moved. Uh, Ethel Laginska did not follow those rules, but Margaret Hillis did. And one of the things that was interesting about her was in the same review it would say, Margaret Hillis's gestures are so contained and so masculine and so appropriate. And then in the same review it would say, Margaret Hillis, her gestures are not very expressive. Yeah. You couldn't win. And two other things, and then I will, I will wrap this up. The resilience of these women was so impressive. They did not take that criticism personally, or at least they didn't show it. They did not focus on the negative. They did not blame their failures on their gender. They paid attention to the criticisms that were in the, in the papers and uh, that were being uh, thrust upon them, and they would say, which of these apply to me? And they'd get better. And they would pay, and Margaret Hill has saved all of her reviews. I was astonished when I read some of them. But they did get better over time. The, the critics softened because she would pay attention and fix things that they were criticizing. And the last thing I want to say is, and I don't even know if I was forwarding this, this was Margaret Hillis's chorus. These were these wonderful conductors. And I do want to say that it was not, the pattern that, I, that emerged as so prominently is, it was not about the, it was not about them. It was about the music. They focused on what they loved to do, and that was their, priori their priority. So with that, I will turn it over to the panel. Cheryl, thank you very much for that. Now I'd like to move to the more recent past and ask Baron, can you talk about what you faced in the uh, early 1980s when you were getting started? Does any of that sound vaguely familiar? Yeah, sadly, sadly, I think um, not much has changed, to, to be honest. And I, I think that the qualities that you discuss are, are really the same qualities that enabled me to succeed. Um, the idea of persevering regardless of the kind of criticism or obstacles. Um, just from my perspective, uh, I, um, I tried to go to school for conducting. I had graduated um, in, I uh, got my master's in violin performance from Juilliard School, and I applied for the conducting program. And the first year I applied, I, I got a form letter from them saying that my academic credentials did not meet their standards. I had just got my master's from them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So that was the first letter. Then the second year I applied and I got, actually got an audition and I went to the audition and I got to the final round of the audition. I mean, I really barely conducted much at all and uh, they like to put mistakes in the orchestra so it, it was like a mistake detecting round and so I said something funny in the way that I can't help myself and the orchestra started laughing and stomping and clapping and they said, uh, That'll be quite enough, That's thank you. We don't need to hear any more from you. Um, the great thing was the conducting teacher there, um, uh, a few years later, uh, he was up for the same job um, as I was, uh, and I won the job, so. Uh, <laughs> 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 
And, but then, um, not giving up yet, <laughs> I applied one more time to Juilliard, and uh, I got a, um, I got an audition again, and this it was a different conducting teacher this time, and you know the, he we had to do the, all these piano reductions, and my instrument is violin, of course, so you know, and I was so nervous about it, and I was I was terrible at that. I did all the all the ear training um, tests and everything were fantastic, and he said to me, you know, you can't be a conductor. I was 23. Your muscles have atrophied, <laughs> and I thought, okay. Well, First of all, I'm not going to play the piano. That's, the, <laughs> that's my point. But I said to him, look, Maestro, and I had known him from Yale. I was an undergraduate at Yale. And um, I said, look, Maestro, I, I don't think you understand. If you accept me as, as your student, I promise I'll be the best student you ever had. And you know, uh, he hesitated for a second. I thought, I got him. <laughs> and he said, no. So then I thought, OK, what am I going to do? So this didn't work. And I, I should mention that I recently was awarded an honorary doctor degree from Juilliard, and I brought my rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty funny. But, um, so I decided really, like so many women in the past, that the only way I could figure out how to conduct was to form an orchestra. And so that's exactly what I did. And uh, I happened to play a, a gig at a wedding um, and the gentleman whose wedding it was paid in cash, so I thought he would be a good candidate to help me start an orchestra. <laughs> and his name is Tomio Taki, and that's why it's called Taki Alsop Conducting Fellowship, um, because this is a thank you to Mr. Taki, who, who said, um, I, I took him out for a drink, and I said, uh, I'm sure he took me out, actually, um, and I said, uh, <laughs> I, Mr. Taki, I know you don't know me. I just my swing band played at your wedding, but I need help. I there's only one thing I want to do. I want to be a conductor, and I I need somebody to help me. He said, "Well, I really don't like classical music." He, he still doesn't, I don't think. But he said, uh, "But I'll help you." And 18 years he's supported my orchestra. 18 years. Great job. So it's exactly what you're saying, and I started my orchestra with, uh, with friends and people I respected so that they would be a good, um, uh, good constructive a group of criticizers, you know, so they would give me feedback, so and they were incredibly helpful and, and tough on me too, a lot of the times. Um, then, so I had my own orchestra, it's one of the qualities you said. Um, repertoire niche, exactly, because uh, I love um, American jazz, so I, that was my repertoire niche before crossover was popular, it was that kind of thing. And, you know, I think not much has changed um, in terms of, of what you, you were um, quoting historically. Um, sadly, I didn't recognize one of the women's names. Um, so that tells you something, that women's stories also are not preserved and they're not passed on. Um, let me see what, what else can I say? The, I, I managed to, I think perseverance is the key. I applied to Tanglewood five times and on the fifth time, I not only got in, but I was accepted as a conducting fellow. And I thought they made a mistake. So, you know, I called them, I was like, are you sure? I mean, it's not Al Saad. Okay, no, it's Al Saad. And, um, and that was really a huge opportunity. Not only did I meet Kristen there, but my partner, but I, I also um, was selected. You know, the thing about really having to persevere that's so great is that when you get the opportunity, you really understand that this is a, a singular opportunity of a lifetime. You know, everybody else was busy having beers and partying, no way. I was studying around the clock. You know, I was so committed, and um, they selected me then to conduct a concert with my hero, the person that inspired me to to want to become a conductor, Leonard Bernstein. And so he became my teacher and my mentor. I mean, sadly, he, he didn't live a, a lot longer. But that was very, very helpful to me, but I have to say that in, in 2016, I think it was, um, my, predecessors, my predecessor at the Baltimore Symphony, um, Yuri Temerkanov, sat yeah. in my dressing room 
and said and in an interview to the Baltimore Sun when he came back as a guest conductor at my invitation that he still didn't think women could conduct and but it's really more a matter of taste you know he doesn't like fish so you know he doesn't eat fish I was like oh I really can't believe this is happening but <laughs> Not at your invitation. Me. Yeah, at my invitation too. But, you know, things like that. And one of our um, uh, younger Taki uh, fellows was telling me that uh, recently she was up for a job and they offered her the job. And when, when it didn't work out, uh, just because she didn't want the job, they, they said, well, you know, we were surprised that, that they would even consider a woman because they had a woman a long time ago and she didn't do well. So they said, no more women. And I thought to myself, you know, the, the measure of success for women is going to be the day when we yeah. can be mediocre and still have opportunities. Yeah. Because they didn't say when they didn't like a man, we'll never have a man again. Right. So, right. you know, that's, that's what that's I'm thinking this, moving forward. Yeah. So that's uh, a little bit of my history. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Now, Jerry, can we move to a little bit to the more recent past, um, asking what you were facing when you were coming up in the early 2000s? Certainly. I'd, I'd like to say it was new and different, um, yeah. but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so a little more forward. Um, and so I think I will start um, with the perseverance. The, the, these are the mm -hmm. themes that we've already been, been speaking about. So. Um, young conductor, like many of us sitting here, like all of us were, looking for opportunities. Um, I did not have a lot of encouragement um, when I told people I wanted to conduct. I went to Wellesley College um, and then University of Chicago, yay, for graduate yeah. school. Yeah. Um, and the response when I told my teachers that I wanted to conduct was decidedly cool. Um, they were not encouraging and said, oh, you should go here. They just said, okay. Mm -hmm. No, and that was it. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, okay, that that's fine. I'm undaunted. I have a passion and a dream and a desire and the will, and I believed I had the talent. And so you just persevere. Um, and um, again, I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, very entrepreneurial in terms of a niche. My niche was having friends who were wonderful young composers. Uh, who needed their pieces done. I was a young conductor who needed experience, and so we would just form a trade. I'll do their pieces for free. And so I really grew up doing the kind of repertoire that no one wanted to do, doing contemporary stuff, things that there wasn't a recording for, that you had to study on your own, that was difficult and complicated and new. Um, and so I, I kind of honed my craft on that. Um, and casting about for opportunities, as, as we all do as young conductors, I was at the point where I was really going to give up because I just couldn't see, it was, it was difficult to find things, it was difficult to do things. So I heard about this Taki all, you know, Concordia, as what was called the Taki Concordia Conducting Fellowship. I said, oh, all right, I'll put a, a, you know, a tape in and see what happens. And I still remember the phone call that I got um, during the summertime. I was visiting my parents at their home in, in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And I picked up the phone and it was actually Kristen who had called me. Yes, you had called me, Kristen. Yes, you. Yeah. And, um, and she told me, well, we've selected you for the talkie. I said, wait, me? It kind of like you, like, you mean me? Like Johnson, not Johnston? You know? I, like, <laughs> Where did you get this number? Right, like, <laughs> you, you, you met me. And I cried on the phone. I said, um, this came along at just the right time because I was seriously considered becoming a buyer for Neiman Marcus. <laughs> Love Neiman Marcus. Um, but, you know, I, but I was like, I just, I don't know, you know, how much more I can sustain of this rejection and uncertainty and whatever. And so it was a real lifeline winning the Taki when I won it. So I have a great year with Marin. And that was the first time I had done Time Machine with her. Um, with, for the three conductors uh, when I was the fellow. Um, and so it was really lovely to be able to do it again um, last night with, with Laura Jackson. Um, and after I won this wonderful fellowship, went all around the world and had these great opportunities, 
and I go out on the job trail with you know even more confidence and experience and exposure as a you know music director candidate at jobs. And again, rejection continues. But I was making it up now to the finalist level. Yeah. And um, what happens is um, you find out you didn't get a job when you see the announcement of the paper, and it's someone else's name. <laughs> um, that's generally how you find out that you didn't get the job. So it's very unusual for orchestras to offer the unsuccessful candidates feedback or an opportunity to speak with them. So one orchestra in California said, look, you didn't get the job, but we'd love to speak with you if you have any questions. So I said, great, this is a wonderful opportunity for feedback, mm -hmm. which I desperately need and, and is very welcome. And the gentleman on the phone was, was very nice. He said, look, the orchestra loved you and great conducting and you, we thought you had great ideas. And I'm thinking, all right, this is all very good. I said, so, you know, what, what did I not do right or what didn't quite click with you? And he said, well, we just didn't know how to market you. And, and this was like 2006 timeframe. And I'm confused. I mean, you see marketing all around here. But like, what are you talking about? You put a thing on a bus and place an ad. And it's like, I, don't, I, I, I genuinely did not know what he meant. That's how naive I was. And he says, look, you just don't look like what our audience expects the conductor to look like. At which point I then fully understood what he meant. And, and it was, that was a hard truth. Um, and I was bitter and angry for a good six months. Like I just was an unpleasant human being to be around. I didn't want anything to do with orchestras. Every time I walked by the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia, I wanted to burn it down. I mean, I was just full of rage. And I called up Marin and I said, I don't know what to do about this. And she says, you're gonna have to do what I did. You're gonna have to prove to people that you can do this. You're gonna have to prove that you have the skills and the talent and, and, and even that from an institutional standpoint that you can be the face of an institution and it won't fold financially automatically because you are the leader of it. And so she says, you're gonna have to start your own group, which is what I did. So again, all of these things that you're hearing that, that Cheryl reported on in the 20s, 30s, 40s through, through Marin, they, they continued. And so that's how I founded Black Pearl. Um, and so all of these things continue. I would say the only maybe twist in my story, and maybe we'll talk about that a yeah. little later, is the intersectionality. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term, um, there, it, in terms of you know, how we all have various identities of, you know, between gender identity or sexual orientation or race and ethnicity, um, all these kinds of things, that as, as a black woman, the things that I faced and dealt with were slightly different because I could not ever tell from a rejection um, if it was just young conductor, just not a right fit, whether it was because I'm a woman, whether it was because I was black, whether it was mm -hmm. a combination of being a black woman. Also American. Or American. American, you oh. know, all, all yeah, exactly. Um, and so there are very many layers um, <laughs> that, that I was dealing with and, and having to navigate, I would say would be the only twist on the story. But as you can hear, these patterns haven't changed. Um, and that's why this festival and this initiative um, is, is so incredibly important. I think the critical mass that you're seeing, and these aren't even all of us, there's so many Taki um, sisters who were not able to be with us, but, but this critical mass um, and what's happening here, um, here at Ravinia is so incredibly important. Thanks, Jerry. Now it's time to move into the present, although we are seeing that the past indeed is present in the present. Um, I'd like Anna to kick things off. Um, she's built a very impressive resume, and I'm interested in her perspective on what kind of challenges and opportunities she's dealing with as a female conductor, and maybe perhaps in Europe and in Poland specifically. Well, I wish I would have a good news for you and <laughs> tell you that <laughs> it has changed, that the times are fa fantastic and the world is open to women, but the reality is that it's not. Um, I think that in Europe it's much easier than in States. I mean, from what I hear uh, when I came here, I have heard so many shocking stories. Uh, in Europe, uh, can you imagine, we have 2023, right? Um, oh, 22. 22, 22. Yeah, 22, <laughs> sorry. <Okay. laughs> See, I'm thinking 
about the future already. Yeah. So, 2022. I'm working in my country since over 15 years. And all the chief conductors knows me. They know how I work. Uh, the orchestras, I can tell each musician by name. And can you imagine that those chief conductors still can tell to my agent, the, my Polish agent, that uh, I do not accept women, although I like to be with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the reality. Um, these days, um, there are many in Europe, there are many young female conductors that start to build their careers. Um, five years ago, I have met um, a management from, 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 from no, I think it was from Nor Norwegia, um, from Scandinavian uh, country. And he said, look, in five years, there will be a big field for women conductors. Just watch out. And they started to build uh, these opportunities. And five years later, actually it is happening. <laughs> there are a lot of women in Europe um, having possibilities to uh, work as a guest conductors, uh, but just a few as a chiefs. And the problems that need to be solved now is that those women who become chief conductors, they do not support women. They do not uh, invite women that often that I think they should because there are so many good female conductors around the Europe, around the world, in states, um, and they do not do that. So I think this is the thing that we need to solve now because this is the time when, when many things are changing and uh, this is the, I think the, the historical point that female finally have a possibility to speak loud like we speak today. Mm -hmm. And, and people like you, Marin, built this um, opportunity to build a new um, friendships between women conductors. Because now the field is built with huge, um, it's, it's like a big competition between women. It's, it's really competitive. And you build a community of incredibly talented uh, female conductors who are great human beings and this community gives a possibility that we will destroy this thinking of being competitive to each other. Uh, so this is the, the most important thing. The second thing is I think yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've raised in a, in, in a work, in an environment that actually do not welcome women. Because then if you hire women, they, they may have children and that causes problems. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. So I think the moment when we become chief conductors, we can build the possibility for female conductors and for female musicians in orchestras to give the opportunity to take care of their children so that they can w go to work and work like they can do the best. Because I mean, there are, I have met really a lot of incredibly talented musicians, not just uh, conductors, and they do not have a possibility to, to work really good because they constantly think, what I'm gonna do with my child? I mean, I, the way I worked for last, 12 years, my son is 12. I took the five-year-old child traveling with me for concerts, and then I put him into my wardrobe, gave him, you know, book to read, and begged him, please stay and sit here for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, although he has too much energy like I do, this was the only five hours on the day that he was just really sitting in one place because he knew how important it is for me to go to the rehearsal next, next door and just do the thing that I love to do. I know that not all children can sit that long. <laughs> you know? So that's why I think it's so important that we, chief conductors, build that possibility uh, for women to have to hire a 
nanny, someone who will take care of our children during the, the uh, rehearsal we do in the, in the orchestra plays. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? So, okay. If I may, Again. The, the second second thing is that um, men conductors, the, all my colleagues that makes huge careers, um, they have a chance to learn three or four programs for the whole year, and they travel with these programs mm -hmm. to many orchestras, so they can do a lot of concerts mm -hmm. with just three, four programs, which gives them. Um, really a lot of time to just really focus on this music, mm -hmm. to have time mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. think about the music and also to have a normal life. And female conductors, they do millions of little programs during the one year, so they don't sleep because they have to learn all those programs. So my dream is that we can do that too. We choose three, four programs and just then we can travel and get tour <laughs> with, with those mm -hmm. programs. Uh, to different orchestras, big programs, not just to little pieces, not just to woman conductors, uh, c uh, composers, just also with huge programs like male conductors does. Thank you all so much. This is wonderful to get us started. Now I would just like to open us up to any conversation. People jump in as they like. I'm going to throw something out there um, to get us started. Has Me Too helped? I, I, will, I was going to try to address that. I think that, um, I, I mean, it's so interesting to hear how how little things have changed. On, and But I think that really the change factor, um, sadly, was the social movements, Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. I think without those, we would be exactly where we were 30 years ago. So um, I think uh, that was the only time I saw that, I, I wouldn't call it a recept receptivity, but, but I would call it um, a necessity. You know, because organizations were forced, they, their feet were being held to the fire. So I can say that, you know, it's one thing to say the chief conductor should hire women. How many times I sat in an artistic meeting and said, why don't we have more women as guest conductors? And I was met with so much resistance. You know, even, um, even when it was starting to become interesting for orchestras, or uh, not interesting, necessary, I said, look, why don't we try to do something dramatic and really feature a diverse conductors on the podium? And one of the musicians said to me, you know, come on, I, I can't play for, that'll be like, I don't know, 13 weeks under with women conducting. And I said, well, nine of them are with me. I mean, you know, it's like, it was just four guest conductors. But this is what I've, and still this, and, and also the audacity to say these things out loud. You know, that's what uh, is always constantly shocking to me. So I would say that um, I, I'm grateful to these social movements, really grateful. But I'm also very suspect because institutions could have done this 20 years ago, and they really chose not to. I mean, really chose not to, because I was there saying, come on, yeah. you could do this, why don't we do this? No, absolutely not, we're not going to do this. So my feeling is that it's a shame that, it's a shame that abuse of human beings was the cause to open up the field. <laughs> you know, that bothers me on one level. Number two is that Sometimes now I'm seeing that the people who they select have to tick certain boxes. They have to be certain ages. They have to be certain, you know, so this is always also concerning me. So while I'm happy that things are changing, I feel like now is the moment, and we see this in politics, now is the moment for women to be vigilant. 
I don't know, I don't, I don't, I respect everyone's politics, but you know, the fact that the ERA has been ratified, Equal Rights Amendment, after, I think it first started in 1923, trying to, to get it ratified. It's been ratified. People don't even know it's been ratified. And someone in the archives at the government refuses to put it forward to become part of our constitution. And how can we sit and let that happen? But we're doing that because we have to have, we have to band together and stand up. I mean, for women of all, who have all beliefs, it doesn't matter, but equality is equality, period, the end. So, anyway. Sorry, I'm just right. Any other thoughts? I was just tagging on to what you're saying about what was interesting hearing from your insider perspective of having those conversations in the, in the executive yeah. back rooms about how these artistic decisions get made and the danger of literally the push towards diversity being purely performative. And I say that in, in, in two ways, performative in terms of just the performers on yeah. the stage and that it isn't really changing the system and the structures of classical music. And so why this festival is so important and why we're so grateful um, to, to the, the women's board, if I'm saying this correctly for putting this on, is that in order for those changes to not be performative, for them to be more long lasting, there have to be overlapping systems and, and, and structures in play to make it last. And so it can't just be an artistic decision, an artistic initiative to make these changes. It has to be supported by the board. It has to be supported by the people who fund these initiatives, who have literally the power in these dynamics to say, this is what we expect of our organization, and this is what we demand. Otherwise, we're not going to support those organizations. <laughs> and so <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be inside, it has to be outside, it has to be from the grassroots, and it has to be from the top down in order for those things to change. And Marin is sadly absolutely right. Um, you know, just the reality of my career is that um, after George Floyd was murdered, I got a ton more work. Yeah. Now I'd been around yeah. here this whole time, doing all these great things this whole time, and it wasn't until the summer of 2020 that orchestras and opera companies lifted their heads up and said, hey, we'd like to hire you. And I mean, I got emails from major institutions out of the blue. Like, I didn't even know how they got my email address. Yeah. But I'm sitting there with my daughter, you know, who's at home, because, you know, it's like an hour of virtual schooling for a five-year-old, it's crazy. <laughs> but like, you know, I'm at home with her and, you know, dinner, and I'm just going through my emails like, wow, did they email me? They, oh no, that seems to be me. Like, oh, they meant it, and I call these people up. We would like, I'm like, how do you even know about me? George Floyd, and, and people now all of a sudden are finding a conscience, they're finding that they had been performative before or just not really paying attention to these things before and now they wanna do something real. And so it is part of, to your, to your point, Anna, about when women become chief conductors or when you have these things, that you give other women opportunities, that you hire other women. And so you see, even within the talkie circle, um, women giving women opportunities. I think a number of us um, have gone or are going to Carolyn Kwan's group. I wanted to, Carolyn! Um, to Hartford Symphony, Lydia Yankowska, who's supposed to be here. At, oh, she's waving her hand. Hey, Lydia! Her Chicago Opera Theater. I've done something there. And so we have these opportunities to create a network to, to help each other out and create that critical mass of, of leadership at various levels. So women on the boards of institutions, you guys are part of the solution in all honesty. You can really help keep this movement going forward into the future. So thank you for what you're doing now and for hopefully what you do in the future. I, I have a question about this. Um, Anna seems to be confronting um, sexism that is more overt, just saying we don't hire women, I don't want women. But conducting is a very difficult field and, and male conductors go out and they don't get jobs. Is it hard to know if you're being rejected because you're a woman or just because that's the breaks of the game? 
you have any thoughts on that? Well, hey, anybody? I think that's a great question. I don't, I don't mean, if, Anna, if you want to jump in, but I, I think it's a great question because, you know, this is a, um, and it's a difficult question, it's a complex question, um, because there's so many unknowns that go into decisions yeah. uh, that are made. I would say that the key to success is never assuming that you didn't get something because of your gender. Because once you start giving yourself that pass, you don't look at yourself to improve. Oh, I didn't get that because I'm a woman. You know, maybe I didn't get that because I'm a woman, so I'm going to be better. That's my motto. You know what I mean? Like trying to, trying to use the rejection that was part of what you said, or someone said, uh, to, to figure out how to just continue to be better so that they can't find a reason. You know what I mean? Just try in that way. But I, I have to say that I, I'm still, there are moments when I think to myself, I don't say it out loud, but I really wonder if this person would be saying that if I were a man. I mean, I mean a few moments, you know, here and there. Every day, um, <laughs> but I also think that there's a there's a difference in sexism the way it's expressed in the United States and elsewhere. In you know I can't say every country I've been to, but in Europe, I have to say that I've had the experience of people saying, you know, we we really think you're fantastic, but I can't work with a woman. And listen, I would rather have that because I would rather know where I stand than in the United States where supposedly everything is open yeah, and that yeah. is a complete lie. Yeah, right. So that's my feeling. You know, I'd rather know. If you have trouble with that, at least we can have a conversation and I know what's going on. But when it's all, you know, no, well, you're not good enough because you move too much or you're too, uh, friendly. I don't know what it is. I, you know, you can't, you can't imagine the things I've heard, really. So that's my feeling. Then I was going to say, Anna, if you can. I have been uh, rejected so many times that I, I have a feeling that I am a rock. I mean, you can just <laughs> hit me and I just don't feel anything. <laughs> Anna <laughs> you know? the rock. But every time, every time when I was rejected, I said to myself, okay, you have to turn this into an opportunity. So it was not a place for you. Your, you know, your goal should be some different direction. And um, uh, it was always, you move too much, yeah, or that. you are a daughter of your mother, though that's, the, my, that's my favorite one. You're a daughter of your mother, uh, so you, you, you owe everything to be a daughter of your mother, and you have never learned anything. Yeah. Um, Wait, her um, mother is a conductor. Did, we, yeah. did you get that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Yes, and uh, so there was always something. So I always was thinking, my God, okay, so if they reject me, there's something wrong with me. What is it? What is it, actually? Because they, do, they never say this into your face, what is wrong, actually. It's like just going like that. Um, so when I applied to, to Taki, and when I was waiting for, for your call, Christine, uh, I was thinking, oh God, again. I will hear that, no, it doesn't have, no, you move to, to big, you know, you're, you're Polish, you're a woman, <laughs> you're anything. So when you called and Christine told me, you, 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 I remember what you said to me, I, th I, I just stopped talking and at home I talk all the time. So I saw the, the screen and, in the, and on the back of the screen my family waiting like, <laughs> and I was just, <laughs> <laughs> so we stopped talking, I just closed the computer and I just sit down on the floor and didn't speak for 10 minutes and they were all waiting because you know, this, this moment was the proof that there is somebody who trusts in you and this is what you do and I think this is the thing that each of us have um, felt when they got that call from you that after so many rejections, there are great artists, great people who see this thing in you and they want to help you. They trust in your talent and they will guide you. They are the people who, 
who you can trust and with whom you can talk. Because, you know, conductors is a very lonely job. Female conductors, it's double so uh, um, lonely. So to have all those women who are not being in competition between each other, they are being just friends, simply. It is such a unique thing that I think you cannot dis discover it anywhere. So I hope we have to bring it to Europe. <laughs> no. We, we really have to bring it to Europe because, you know, as a European, I'm jealous that it happens in the States. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. One question I wanted to... One question I wanted to ask that I think a lot of us wonder about. Um, it's always been a situation with women, if they do exactly what men do, then they are perceived very differently. You know, if you become excited, a, a man is, you know, emotional or whatever, a woman is shrill, or she's too sentimental, whatever. How do you deal with that in terms of the way you lead an orchestra, the way you approach musicians and gestures? Uh, the, um, no. Well, this is something I've spoken about it because I think about it so often mm -hmm. that, um, and uh, I, I'm sure I've spoken to every um, every talkie, uh about this that that the you know sadly it's it, it's more it's always more complicated for women because we also have a whole. Um, a whole uh, sort of level of societal interpretation. So when a, when a woman, you know when you shake hands with somebody, you know, meet somebody for the first time, and when a man shakes your hand and, you know, strong, you think, ah, good, good guy, okay. And then when a woman shakes your hand and it's too strong, you're like, okay, wait, back <laughs> off. It's, it's interesting, you know, it's just the way we react, and it's not, um, I do too, you know, it's, if I do, then I think, oh my God, <laughs> that everybody. So when conducting is all about body language and about gesture, and body language is interpreted very differently when it comes from a woman, the same gesture. And uh, so, you know, I always am, and I will say it out loud, look, that looks girly to me, because I'm trying to, enable people to, women to get rid of any kind of gender association in their gesture. Because, you know, if a man does something frilly, he's sensitive. But it, if a woman does it, then she's weak, you know, or girly or, or whatever it is. So I think for us, we have to not only, um, not only be you know, supremely good at what we do. We also have to think about this extra level um, when we're practicing our gestures and that kind of thing. So this is what something that I, I try to share with um, my students always. And, um, and I try to talk about it also in front of um, male students so that they hear the issues that we have as well. Jerry, do you have some thoughts on that? I'm, I'm interested, you were talking about um, your situation as a black female, some being sure. different. I, oh. um, yeah, it, it is, um, it is, so I think my experience as an African American woman on the podium from the point of view of, of perceptions is a little different. And so just for framework, you know, there's been a lot of, um, public discussion and a lot of research being done about, for example, healthcare disparities between African American women and, and white women in terms of, especially the very famous case, maybe made of Serena Williams when she had yeah. her baby, yeah. unable to get the doctors to believe her that something was very wrong. Um, and so there's been a lot of look into the way black women are cared, cared for or not in the healthcare system in terms of not being pain, being given pain medication, not being believed that they're actually in pain. Um, and, and just the way that medical students are taught to think about black bodies versus uh, white bodies. And so when I listen to a lot of these struggles that my white female colleagues have on the podium in terms of gender perceptions and stereotypes, those things honestly have not, knock wood, and don't, won't, apply to me in the same way, and I haven't had to deal with them 
primarily because I am not perceived of as a woman in the same way that they are, because I'm black. Yes, and, and so um, people don't look at me and think I'm too girly. People don't look at me and think when I'm being strong that I'm being overly aggressive because of the stereotype of the quote unquote angry black woman. Now, I'm not angry on the podium, I'm not you know, any of these things, but, but that kind of stark male, female, gender, strong, weak, those kinds of binaries in a, in a strange way, I'm a little insulated from because the racial thing takes precedence oh, wow. oh, over, man. over those things. And I'm laughing. It's not really funny. Um, <laughs> oh. It's a laugh of like how ridiculous this is. Yeah. But, but this is, so for me, I, I, when we have our interesting conversations, I, I learn um, with empathy about the things that that face them, that, that I'm like, wow, I've, I've, I have never heard that. Um, from people, and it's because I'm perceived very differently in that regard. And so for me, um, like again, it, for me it was very freeing to hear that I don't look like what the audiences expect a conductor to look like. That immediately made me understand that I was so outside of the system of whatever goes on that I was really free to do whatever I wanted to do because it didn't matter in, in some ways because no one was ever gonna think of me as Karyon. No one was ever gonna think of me as Leonard Bernstein or, or, or and reminisce and like, oh, make a linkage to that because I was so far outside the framework of people's perceptions. Yeah. And so it, it made me a better conductor in that regard because I um, could take risks um, and for me, the strength of my authority was derived not from um, a, a, a perceived connection to a past great master. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had to derive my authority from my own hard work, my own research, my own hard practice and diligence and fortitude and just doing it. Um, and so, it, it, I think it, it was actually mm -hmm. beneficial to hear that really horrible truth because it kind of set me free to my own path towards achievement and excellence. That's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, I want to move on now to the future. And um, Jeff Hayden put together a question that I think is really very useful. What do you need to succeed? What do orchestras need to do? What do ensembles need to do to help female composers, conductors succeed? Cheryl? I, I'd like to start that because I'm looking at the audience as you're hearing these stories and I'm seeing eyebrows go up. Just a show of hands, how many of you are surprised to have heard any of the things that you heard today? Raise your hands. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, I think, if you want the answer to where we go from here. I think it starts with being aware and having uh, the tools, that, uh, the stories. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote about Margaret Hillis is we were, I, I teach at a university and my students are saying, who's Margaret Hillis? I work with the Chicago Symphony Chorus, members of the chorus, who's Margaret Hillis? She's not been gone that long. Yeah. And, and then all of the other women who, if you walk around the park and you see those posters, we have to know our history to be able to not repeat it, right? And to be able to excel. And I think that's really a, an, important, an important part of this process. That's what I think. Um, I think that, you know, we had the movement Me Too, Black, Mer Black Mer Matters. I think this is the time for uh, female conductors, you know, a time that we create this movement because there is opportunity, I think, to build this movement. Um, and I think that if we all conductors, when we become chief conductors, that if we do your job, like pushing the board to, to, to hire women, and if we all speak loud, mm -hmm. someone is gonna hear us. Mm -hmm. But we, ha we all have to do it, that's the thing. So we have that, that critical mass. That's the only way to do it, I think. I'm very interested in your um, suggestion about childcare for musicians. And it's one of those things, I mean, Anna brought it up, and 
I thought to myself, well, duh. You know, there are lots of very large spaces in lots of symphony halls. One of them could be turned over during rehearsals for um, taking care of the little ones. And that's not, it's not that big a deal. Do you know what I mean? It's not, you're not creating, um, having to have um, all sorts of extra um, rooms or building a separate place or a, just open it up the way churches do. Um, you know, you go to services and in most churches there's a little place for the, the babies. Um, yeah, but you, you run into, I've, I've been down this path many times, time, you right? know, with orchestras and uh, also talking about audiences, you know, so that audiences, so parents with young kids could come to concerts or if they were earlier. But, you know, you're going to be met with the, the, first of all, the United States. We ha why don't we have child care? I mean, it's ridiculous. Let's, yeah. let's start there. Yeah. That's where we need to start. And, and so, and of course, there's so many, um, there's so many legal and insurance complications yeah. to taking care of kids. You know, so that orchestras are, they're, first of all, they're living, you know, most orchestras live on a very thin margin of stability, <laughs> if you can even call it that. And they can't afford to take a chance of even having a lawsuit. So mm -hmm. these are, mm -hmm. these are uh, I think, big issues. But I do think that what Jerry was saying, that it comes from the top. It comes from the people that support, that fund. It comes from someone like Jeff Hayden taking a chance on doing this. It, take, it takes people. <laughs> It, it takes the people at the top, and it need, we need to have women, we need to have a woman president, we need to have women in the top positions of these orchestras, because then we can affect the rest. We, you can only crawl your way up so far. You have to have some people at the top helping you. That's my opinion. But you know, it's very interesting when I think about it, there are women at the top, the CEO levels of major orchestras. I'm thinking of somebody like Deborah Borda, Deborah Rutter. Um, in Chicago, I mean, Lyric Opera of Chicago was founded by a woman and, and her successor was a woman who built it into something even greater. Um, so those women are out there. We just need to keep pushing. Keep pushing. I would like to open this up for questions from the audience or comments if anybody has anything that they might be interested in. Yeah. I'm curious what you see at the music school level in terms of higher education, graduate school of music. What message do you want to send to those students here and what role, if any, is the faculty of those schools um, playing in this whole in terms of gender equality or equality in general? Um, you know, sadly, I think that, I think that women are constant, you know, there was sort of a focus and then COVID, you know, women always have to kind of step aside while something more important happens. This is what I feel that issues of gender equality are always shelved mm -hmm. for more important issues, more important issues. Um, and the other issues are super important as well. The DEI in initiatives, these are very, very important. But I, I would like to see more um, commitment to equality. And if it's not intentional, it won't happen, in my opinion, uh, in my experience. I think that we have to say, institutions have to say, look, we're gonna recruit and we're going to have, you know, by, 2030, it's going to be 50-50. Or institutions say, by 2030, we're going to, you know, so you set a goal, as they did in Canada, you know, when the leadership of, of, of Canada said, we're going to have 50% rep representation so that it's equal. And of course, what do they have? They have that now. You know, and, and it, it was very intentional, and, and people owned it. Um, I think when it, women always kind of, oh, that's, you've got enough now. 
you know, or you, you made some strides, that's really good, just, you know, go back to what you were doing. That's what it feels like to me a little bit. And I don't see as many women applying to, um, to school, to Peabody, at least the conservatory, as I did, say, five years ago. We see, I know it's interesting, isn't it? But I see more women applying to something like Taki. And another thing I wanted to just mention is that um, the, the applicants, the, the majority of applicants, Kristen, make sure I get this right, I think the majority of applicants, 70% of our applicants were between the age of 31 and 50. So there's a demographic that sort of has been bypassed. Um, and, and that's also interesting. And there's also another issue, um, not, not to diminish the importance of, of education and higher education, but as women age, there's a different kind of discrimination that also happens. Um, you see lots of conductors are really quite elderly male conductors. And as I say to my manager all the time, um, you know, when, when they say, well, I don't think that's a career path. And I say, yeah, so where are all those old ladies on the podium, you know, that I'm following? <laughs> you know, we have to forge that path also. That's mm -hmm. another fight. I'm sorry to tell all these young women, you're going to have to fight as well. So there, there's so many issues. Um, but maybe, do you, does anybody else teach at, do, do you do teach, do you teach and Master classes and how did how does the um, makeup look in those? Well, I was giving master classes in Poland this uh, this year, and for seven people we had three women. Women, three, three, three. three. Yes. It's good. Um, I think it's it's really good. I was really really happy. But oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not always like that, and it's positive things, because when I hear your story, I have a feeling that many things has changed. Because to be honest, I, maybe it's in the future, I don't know, but I never felt different, or I never feel rejected because I'm a woman, not now, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's waiting. <laughs> Starting to, you're starting to see that a little bit. But I think that's great that the younger generation doesn't feel the, the immediacy of this kind of you know, gender issue, which I think is good, but don't be alarmed if suddenly you're confronted <laughs> with it. <laughs> but there's another glass ceiling here we should talk about if you're talking about universities, because the, and I don't have the statistics, but it was striking when I started out in university teaching, which was a long time ago, um, we were seeing more women, but there are still fewer who are advancing into tenure positions, and even fewer who are full professors. And that is a very, it, it's important for, the, for women coming into a university to see people who look like them, yeah. who can be mentored by people like them. So that's another glass ceiling for another barriers <laughs> we can talk about another time. Yeah. Jerry, did you have? Oh. Oh. Nancy? Yeah. Let me just use the microphone. Oh, oh so for this. Uh... Yeah, we're, we're actually recording this, and we're going to be putting this online, and I want to make sure everybody online can hear this. So I'm just going to hear this. I have a question about the way the orchestra looks like today, the orchestra that you face. I was thinking of coming up in the late 70s and 80s when there was tremendous pressure among musicians who felt that they didn't have an equal chance to get a job in the orchestra, and the um, blind audition process helped with that. So my question to you is today, 
The orchestras that you face have many women in the orchestra. Do you think that helps with the issue of uh, gaining credibility as female conductors in the profession? Do you get good response, good encouragement, support from this base of musicians that you face? Do you have a, any thought on that, Jerry? Oh, um... <laughs> so, I... <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> don't want to put you in, don't want to put you in this spot. Um, I, I think, so it's a very interesting question. Um, I think, um, you know, we are all, you know, when I do a lot of diversity consulting and, and I, I talk about sort of the fishbowl that we all swim in in terms of the same kinds of attitudes and understandings and stereotypes and assumptions in which we all kind of function. And so it's, it's we're all kind of swimming in, in the fishbowl of racism, sexism, gen, what all the, all the isms, you know. And so we're all affected by it, whether or not we think we are or not, whether or not we think we participate in it or not, just by being in a kind of a shared reality, we're kind of swimming in the system. And, and so the, the interesting thing about your question is you would think that having more women in the orchestra, that would be a base of support. Um, and sometimes it is, but also sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you will face some of the criticisms that you think you would only hear perhaps from a man coming from and, and so that is, it, it isn't, um, you know, these are, these, are, um, these are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about who we are, what it means to be American, what it means to be a man, what it means to be black, what it means to be all these things. And so, you know, because we've been living in it since we were born, we don't think about, you know, we, we don't really question a lot of the assumptions. Or, you know, I've been watching a lot of Westworld. Have you been questioning the nature of your reality? <laughs> um, so we don't really always question the nature of our reality all the time. And so I think when we have these opportunities to have these discussions and have these interesting introspective questions, it gives us an opportunity to step back and be like, wow, have I ever been a part of that? Mm -hmm. Have I ever unwittingly um, unknowingly been a part of that assumption that is creating an, an unspoken barrier in, in some way. And, and, and the term that people use about it these days is microaggressions and those yeah, kinds yeah. of things. But yeah, but thank you for your question. Good question. Go ahead. I'll pass it to you next. Um, hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Reed. I'm the CEO of New Music USA. And we're doing a lot of work to support composers of all backgrounds and one fact that people here may not be aware of is generally uh, women represent around about 16 percent of the composers and songwriters in any music genre so that's classical and pop included so in classical music it's probably lower than that um, and as Marin was saying since Me Too there's been a real kind of change in the programming of orchestral music and there's been some brilliant research undertaken that demonstrates how many more female and composers of colour have been, have been um, programmed since, um, since Me Too and since Black Lives Matter. But I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about that building community idea amongst women and the extent to which female conductors are thinking about the gender gap in the repertoire, which of course is mainly written by dead white men in classical music. And so to what extent are you engaged with, tr with trying to champion female composers in the work that you do? And that's a question also to the fellows, if you're thinking about that as well. Um, I have a program <coughs> called Women in Music. Uh, female um, composers in, in music with my orchestra um, and it's, it's supported by a, a government and we go uh, on tour and we'll make like 10 concerts a year around the, around the Poland. So that's how it goes. I always try to put some, if it, there is a possibility to put uh, a female composer into my program and Polish uh, composer always as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've always advocated for women composers, for composers of color, um, and uh, but I, I must confess I haven't advocated for them because they're women or because they're people of color. 
I've advocated for them because I believe in them. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think the burden of opening the door should be put on us yeah. or put on, I think, I think the burden needs to be put on the people who have had the power and the people who preserve the system at all costs because those are the people that can change the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel sometimes that uh, when an orchestra wants to tick a lot of boxes, they kind of throw it to our talkies. You know, can you do a program of all women composers? Then we, oh, got, we got the conductor and the composer. Thank God <laughs> we're done with that. You know, I, I want to see the, the leader of the institution say, this is, again, this is our intentional commitment to composers of, of underrepresented composers, that we're going to bring them into the concert hall. And also, how do we make it palatable and interesting for our audiences, who many of whom are averse to new music? I mean, but that's a whole, you know, that's a whole uh, other topic for another, another symposium. But I think we're depressed enough already. We really <laughs> don't need to. But I would say, I would say, you know, please talk to those people, the people that really hold the positions of power. Thanks for this incredible panel and conversation. I uh, look at all the statistics, all of us who are aficionados of classical music are afraid of declining audiences, audiences getting older, and it seems like uh, we all want to be relevant. And being inclusive is a key part of being relevant, especially to that new generation of people coming who want to see people like them in their classical music situation. So what do you think about that argument about relevance is a critical uh, part of the future of class music being relevant and inclusive. And is that something you think would be resonant? Relevant. Yes, relevant with the idea that it, it speaks to what people, so that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, it speaks to what people are thinking about today. What? Sure, I think um, it's an incredibly important issue. Um, that orchestras have been struggling with for, for many, many years, and, and not just because of Me Too um, and, and Black Lives Matter. It's something that they've struggled with. And I think the, the, the twin pandemic, I would say, of, of racism, sexism, coupled with COVID has really brought it home to audiences because while people spoke about the figurative death of classical music, what they saw with COVID and the demographics that, that were primarily struck down in the early days by COVID, what is it, it, and, and that being the overlap in the Venn diagram of classical music traditional audiences, what they were beginning to see was the literal death of classical music at, at that point. Um, and so when I do my diversity consulting, I, I don't talk about the moral good of inclusiveness. What I talk about is the financial benefits of inclusiveness. Yeah. Um, organizations, and, and these are issues that are really not just endemic to classical music, really across all art forms. Um, people are struggling with um, the idea of creating a sense of belonging, because again, when you talk about inclusiveness, it's still people inside, including people who are outside, which means there's still an inside and an outside. And so the issue should be that, that creating a sense of that we all truly belong. Um, and so, um, what is part of the movement and why breaking barriers is so important, why the fact that it's happening at Ravinia, the, you know, the nation's oldest music festival is so incredibly important is um, to create this sense of belonging, you have to bring everyone along. It, it's, 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 it's more than just making sure that orchestras survive. It's the understanding that we as a nation, as Americans, are at a critical point in our country. There is a massive movement, I don't care what your race or age or whatever it is, there's a massive movement to disenfranchise American citizens from the political process. I don't care what your political beliefs are, like Marin said. People are trying to take our rights of participating in American democracy away. Yeah. <laughs> said it, said it out loud. I'm also running for president, but uh, like Mavis Staples. I see it, Mavis Staples. Okay. <laughs> Body rate, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, but, but the point
point is that you know orchestras are are you know 17th century institutions in 21st century America. And so when, when orchestras talk about preserving traditions, it isn't just about bowing techniques and tuggings and fingerings and interpretations. They're talking about maintaining traditions of social structures and attitudes, keeping people out, just like, you know, in the 17th century. And so for, America, for American orchestras to survive, we have to begin to embrace 21st century American democratic ideals. And that means enfranchisement of all people. And so to me, that means American orchestras, rather than being symbols of, of 18th century European ideals, can become a very visible and palpable representation of the best of American democratic ideals. When you see my orchestra, Black Pearl, you see a black woman who's the conductor. You see people in the orchestra who are black, white, Jewish, uh, Latinx, uh, uh, Asian from different Asian countries who are straight, who are, you know, just across gender identities and sexual orientations. They all come from Curtis, from Juilliard. They're, they're the best, they teach at Curtis and Juilliard. They sub with the Philly Orchestra. These are just highly trained, excellent musicians. And we're performing Mozart, we're performing Jesse Montgomery, we're performing Mussorgsky, we're doing all these things. And that is America. Yeah. That is all of us making music together who have been chosen on the basis of their talent and their experience, not because they look a certain way. Yeah. And so to me, I think if, if orchestras can truly begin to embrace that, it, 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 it loses a question of rele relevance or inclusiveness. It is a symbol of America. Yeah, that's that's great. Great. And the campaign and, and Jerry Lynn's campaign started right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> and we should also um, give a shout out to the orchestra that you'll be conducting tomorrow morning. Oh, yes. the yes. Chicago. Yes. The Chicago Sinfonietta, which has had a long-standing, it might be the, the longest-standing yeah, com a commitment right to Chicago. diversity and inclusion. Yeah, founded by Maestro Paul Freeman, um, gosh, f 50 years ago, 48? Yeah. yeah, and it, this is an orchestra really that is, is comprised of a demographic that reflects our communities. And um, Jerry Lynn is conducting them tomorrow morning in a family concert. And if you don't have tickets, I'm sorry. It's already sold out. But um, we're doing a master class uh, with, the, um, with the orchestra, uh, with five of our Takis, um, tomorrow afternoon. And the music director is a Taki. Yeah, the music director is Mayan Chen, who's also a is, Taki. Is that open to the public? Can people come well, see the... Oh. quietly open to the public. Oh. These are, this is a secret, secret I'm sharing. <laughs> OK, how's that? Um, I have a... I have a question. Time. One as more a, question. As an audience member who is not involved in the boards or whatever, what can we do um, to promote more women in the conducting positions? Buy more tickets? Yes. <laughs> I would like you to bring a busload or two of your closest friends to the Chicago Symphony downtown in January when I do a program of all women composers. Let's sell it out. Okay, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up. I just want to conclude with a uh, comment from Nadia Boulanger. Some of you may know this comment already, but she was a she was a gifted composition teacher, but also she was a very gifted composer, a conductor. And in 1938, she came to the U.S. to conduct. She did an extended tour. She conducted the the New York Philharmonic and the um, Boston Symphony, among others. And she was the first woman to conduct the Boston Symphony. Needless to say, she got a lot of questions about that when yet one more reporter asked her one more time what it felt like to be the orchestra's first female conductor, here's what she said. I've been a woman for a little over 50 years, and I have gotten over my initial astonishment. <laughs> So 
so the, the same applies to women on the podium today. We need to get over our astonishment. And to finish off, I would like the Taki fellows in the audience to stand and accept our applause. And if there are any other conductors in the audience, we would like them to stand also. Yeah. All right, ladies, we salute you.